Lehi, the prophet and father who has led his family out of Jerusalem, has grave concerns for his family, specifically Laman and Lemuel, who seem to push back at every word he says. In the midst of this familial strain, Lehi beholds a vision packed with symbolism. It vividly illustrates mankind's need to hold fast to the word of God. Upon hearing his father's words, Nephi responds with a desire to behold everything his father saw. For he that diligently seeketh shall find, and the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost. I invite you to join us in our study of 1 Nephi chapters 6 through 10 of the Book of Mormon and encourage each of us to seek divine inspiration. Welcome to Come Follow Up. For me, um, holding fast to the Word of God means trusting in Him and working through things even when it may be inconvenient and to always remember that it will be beneficial for me in the end and it will strengthen my relationship with Him. One particular point in my life, I had a baby that died. My faith was so tested. I remember one night specifically where I'd really felt like the Spirit had left my presence. And I remember falling to my knees and just pouring out everything that I felt. The scriptures led me to peace. I may not understand all the answers and the things that happen in life, but they led me to peace. After letting all that out, I went through and I just started reminding myself of all the miracles that I have experienced and all the work that He has done and all the glory that I have experienced throughout my life. And that was the beginning of my journey back out of that darkness. Welcome everybody to our discussion on 1 Nephi chapters 6 through 10 of the Book of Mormon. My name is Ben Lomu and I'm your host. Our Gospel Scholar for today is Janet Erickson. Janet is an Associate Professor in the Department of Church History and Doctrine in BYU's Religious Education Program. She received her PhD in Family Social Science from the University of Minnesota and is a columnist for Deseret News. She lives in American Fork, Utah, with her husband, Michael, and their two children. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, Ben. So good to be here. And next to Janet is our special guest, Jorge Coco. Jorge is a self-taught artist with international recognition. He has been dedicated to paint in a new artistic style he created and calls Sacro-Cubism, which portrays sacred and religious events in a style of painting with features of the post-Cubist art movement. Jorge, welcome. Gracias. Thank you. And we're also joined by our studio audience. Thank you all for being here today. Our discussions today are built around the scriptures and complemented by the resource, Come Follow Me. Additional study and teaching material is available at byutv.org slash come follow up. Okay, Janet, would you mind giving us an overview and some context to these chapters? Yes, yeah, so happy to do that. Well, Nephi has gone and gotten the plates as instructed by his father, Lehi. And Lehi studying the plates. We're going to be introduced to Nephi describing what he's going to be doing with the plates. Then Lehi providing teachings, including his vision of the tree of life that we treasure. And then he'll be describing prophecies about how the Lord will gather his scattered family, scattered Israel back, and the work of the Savior in each life and in the work of that gathering. Mm -hmm. The first topic we're going to be discussing today is holding fast to the Word of God leads me to the Savior and helps me feel His love. Where do we see that topic, topic specifically within these chapters? Yes. Lehi is going to have this dream that he describes as a vision. And in the vision, he will see the tree of life. We'll talk through that. The only way to get to this tree of life is holding fast to this rod of iron, the Word of God, the Savior Himself. So there's, there's how we learn about what it means to partake of that delicious fruit of eternal life. Jorge, as an artist, how do you interpret scriptures into your art? See, si, me, yes, uh, my artistic training was common to all those who take 
the path of art, uh, learning about all resources to find a personal style. When I found the gospel, I started to do religious painting, and my first pieces of art were just made in a conventional way until the moment I saw I was just repeating an account. The scriptures have a second interpretation a third interpretation, and an interpretation which is absolutely individual. Then I looked for elements of what I had practiced because I didn't want to make a, a photograph of what happened because we didn't actually see it. There are many artists who painted it as it could have happened, but the scriptures have so much more than just a historical account. So I put elements that were somewhat abstract in my painting to function in the same way that a harmony of sounds elevates us spiritually and brings us closer to God. And the relationship of a shape and a color by itself can also elevate us. For me, it is a tremendous commitment because it is transmitting things most important that a human being should know through images. Thank you, Jorge, for that explanation. I would love to talk a little bit about some of the, the symbolism within this vision of the Tree of Life, starting with the rod that uh, Lehi is seeing. Um, what does this rod of iron symbolize? And it's beautiful, Ben, to think about how we're told in John, the book of John, that Christ is the Word. He is the messenger of the covenant. He's the way whereby our heavenly parents fulfill the covenant of redemption with us. He sees this tree, and first he partakes of the tree, and then he's wondering how do people get to the tree, and he sees this rod by a path. This tree that is the love of God is gotten to by holding on to this word of God, Christ himself, the messenger of the covenant. And so word of God would be our covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. I love how it says that these groups that come along will take hold of that rod, taking hold of that covenant relationship with Jesus Christ through covenants and ordinances and receiving his word and pressing forward until they reach the tree, that destination, the love of God. Part of this discussion, this vision that Lehi is having, it's not all beautiful. There's a reason why there's a rod. Can we talk about how as those who catch hold of the rod, why is it so important they cling to this rod as they're headed towards the tree? Yes. Well, let's go to these verses okay. that I think Jorge has captured so powerfully in art. But starting in verse 23, and it came to pass that there arose a mist of darkness, an exceedingly great mist of darkness, insomuch that they who had commenced in the path did lose their way without that rod to hold on to through the darkness. And so in verse 24, we're going to read about the group who it will say, they did press forward through the mist of darkness, clinging to the rod of iron, even until they did come forth and partake of the fruit of the tree. When we go down to verse 30, he's going to say, other multitudes were pressing forward and they came and caught hold of the end of the rod of iron and they did press their way forward, continually holding fast to the rod of iron until they came forth and fell down and partook of the fruit of the tree. Jorge, I would love to hear your experience on trying to interpret the vision of Lehi's dream into art. In this case, I painted the tree of life scene as it applies in our own lives. Because the scriptures aren't just a history book. It's a book each person can apply individually. I put the most important elements of Lehi's account representing the vicissitudes of life for any person. The mists of darkness are represented, which happens to so many people. That's beautiful. I would love to hear from the audience, how has clinging to the Word of God helped get you through some of the mists of darkness? Danae. 
I live in an area where there's many thoughts and perspectives that are constantly bombarding me. And I hold on by remembering the teachings of my parents and by listening and remembering the Word of God through my scripture study. And Danae, how does the Holy Ghost help you as you're going through that mist of darkness? What, it, what kind of a strength does the Holy Ghost give you to continue forward? So the Holy Ghost helps me stay on that path by revealing truths, just like a little spark here and there to remind me, no, go this way, no, go this way, even when I'm being bombarded mm -hmm. by so many different ideas and thoughts. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Danae. And speaking of the importance of the rod of iron, Elder Holland says, it is imperative to note that this mist of darkness descends on all the travelers. The principal point of the story is that the successful travelers resist all distractions, including the lure forbidden paths enduring taunts from the vain and proud who have taken those paths. The record says that the protected did press their way forward, continually, and I might add tenaciously, holding fast to a rod of iron that runs unfailingly along the course of the true path. Yes, first and foremost, the rod represents the Word of God. So many times we get close to that river where people suffered the consequences of having let go of the iron rod. In another section, I represented the great spacious building with uh, all the attractiveness of the material parts of this life. Then, the central feature is when the family arrives to partake of the fruit. Because the first reaction Lehi had was to see where his family was and to show them that this was the way to go. And that story is impactful. We can't get there alone. So I represented the family group partaking of the fruit. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes, Janet, as we're going to see in this account, those who make it to the tree and partake of the fruit, they feel ashamed. Mm, yeah, not that amazing? I love how Jorge referenced um, drawing the great and spacious building because we read about this group and it's so painful. They get there, they taste of the fruit, then they hear the mocking voices. And as you captured, the material, all that's physical is captured in that great and spacious building. It has no foundation, but it's compelling because it, it, it meets our kind of desires for approval or mm -hmm. for to be liked or to a taste of pleasures. But I know in my own life, right, how, how it can be so seductive, right, to think you look at these beautiful images of what wealth and popularity and the cool world looks like, and you can be tempted to believe that that will satisfy the hunger of the soul when Lehi is telling us there is one thing that will satisfy the hunger of the soul, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to come to that truth at some point, mm -hmm. right? And I think this is something that a lot of us can wrestle with, this idea of how do I stay on that path? How do I stay true? How do I help others yes. do the same? We had a question coming from one of our viewers. I would love to watch the question and then get some responses. Hi, my name is Eric Tran. I'm from Riverside, California. After Lehi had the vision of the Tree of Life, he said he exceedingly feared for his sons Lamb and Lemuel. As I look around at the people closest to me, I find myself experiencing the same type of fear. My question is, how do I let go of that fear I have for my friends and family who may have fallen away from Jesus Christ and turn that into some sort of comfort going forward? Then there's a verse that I think is so beautiful here, and I love this question. We all have these feelings. Um, when it describes the group that stays at the tree, it says in verse 30, they pressed forward, continually holding, middle of verse 30, fast to the rod of iron until they came forth and fell down and partook of the fruit of the tree. I've heard Elder Bednar talk about this verse, and we've all wondered, what is that? What were they falling down for? And certainly we get the feeling, oh, they've given a lot. They pressed forward. They're, right, like they're exhausted. 
but I can't help but think that the tree is the Redeemer himself. Mm -hmm. And it's so beautiful to think they saw there all that they'd given is embodied in this being who is so glorious and who will do the work of redemption for us and for our children. I remember a stake presidency member once describing holding on to his children's hand as he held on to the rod. And sometimes that's what we're doing. They can't hold on to the rod for whatever host of reasons in their journey, but we can hold on to them and hold on to the rod. And they can experience through us the gift of the covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. That's beautiful. Jorge, how does the vision of Lehi's dream, how has that affected your personal testimony? The memory of this experience it helps me in times of crisis mm -hmm. because it is so perfectly narrated. Moments of absolute darkness, moments of seeing that everything around it is turning towards the great and spacious building. This has strengthened my own testimony. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so very much for sharing your thoughts and comments with us. And for the audience, thank you as well. And for those at home, how do you continually hold fast to the Word of God? Share with us on any of our social media platforms. I think it's important for me personally to know truth because it keeps the adversary from being able to have influence in my life. If it takes me in the path that I know is a good path, then I know it's truth. The test is if it takes me someplace that isn't good, then I know that's false. My seminary teacher used to say, ask of God and not of Google. So I try to live by that and study the scriptures and actually ponder to get answers to my questions. Finding truth is important because I believe that there's truth in all things everywhere around us. Um, and that there's not just one place to find truth, but to know that there is one source of truth, which is our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, and that we can find those things through the Spirit um, through any place that we look for it. Our second topic is God will reveal truth to me by the power of the Holy Ghost. Janet, do you mind providing us with some context to this topic? Yes. So here, Lehi has had this miraculous vision. He's taught it to his sons of the Tree of Life, the one you've captured so beautifully, Jorge. And then he's going to t tell his children about this plan that Father in Heaven has for his son being sent as the Redeemer of the world to help gather his children home. And Nephi is trying to understand all that his father is saying. So we end this section with a beautiful verse in First Nephi 10, verse 17. And it came to pass that after I, Nephi, having heard all the words of my father concerning the things which he saw in a vision, and also the things which he spake by the power of the Holy Ghost, which power he received by faith on the Son of God, and the Son of God was the Messiah who should come, then we hear, I, Nephi, was desirous also that I might see and hear and know of these things by the power of the Holy Ghost. So here is a searching son who's been taught by his father. He's felt the power of the Holy Ghost, and he wants to know for himself. This uh, 17th verse we have just read is very rich because, at least in my personal experience, it describes what happens. Because what Nephi says here is that he knew that his father spoke by the power of the Holy Ghost. This is a very strong statement. And... In my personal experience, the first time I heard the missionaries, I knew they spoke differently from everything I had heard before about religion. Nephi's experience was a miraculous situation. And I can say that the moment the missionaries found me, it was a miraculous situation. The church was not in that city. They walked by practically by accident. So we had 
the experience to be the first members with my wife, and we were baptized in a nearby river close to our home. It's so beautiful, so Jorge, beautiful. to think about. <laughs> I was just thinking, there's that this beautiful word of desire. I, Nephi, was desirous also that I might see and hear and know, and that's what Jorge experienced. Every dispensation, it seems like, begins with someone's quest to know the truth. And I think it's that motivation in Nephi, the same motivation in you, Jorge, my, and hopefully for all of us, this yearning to have greater truth that we can see and know. And maybe it's interesting to think, what is the truth that's most important to know? Which I think he captures when he starts this section that we're studying this week, 1 Nephi chapter 6, verse 4, where Nephi, after thinking back on all of this as he's writing this record, he says, For the fullness of mine intent is that I may persuade men to come unto the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and be saved. And that's covenant language. And that that's going to happen on that covenant path by the power of the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. to come unto him. I would love to hear from the audience, how has the Holy Ghost helped you to see, hear, and know? Dash. Um, so for like maybe a couple months ago, um, I stopped going to church for maybe like five months. And there was always this voice in my head telling me to, to go and it wanted me to go, but I always just brushed it off. And then ever since like maybe two months ago, I decided to listen to it and I started going and it started guiding me in the right direction. Dash, how did you know that those thoughts and feelings you were having were coming from the Holy Ghost? Well, it just like creates a feeling that you can't recreate from anything else. It's a feeling of fullness, joyfulness, and like you feel not lonely. Mm. What a beautiful, beautiful testimony. Dash, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Jorge, I would love to hear from you. How has your art had an influence on others throughout the world? Yes, I can say that I was a little surprised at how so many people were prepared to perceive the truths of the gospel through images. And images can go around the world, and they are the same. No translation needed. And it can go to distant lands. And it really amazes me that uh, this happens. I think we live in a time when many people are becoming sensitive to receiving the truth. I love how Paul teaches us, right, that the things of the Spirit that are beyond our mortal can only be learned by the Spirit. And it's so beautiful, Jorge, to think of you almost bringing from heaven with you these artistic renderings of truth. Absolutely. Can we talk a little bit, Janet, about this idea of how truth is revealed through the Holy Ghost? What are some of the mysteries that can be revealed to us that are being revealed uh, here to Nephi? Oh. Lehi teaches that this city of Jerusalem will be destroyed and that they will be scattered and then they will return. And then he says this beautiful, these beautiful verses, chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, yea, even 600 years from the time that my father left Jerusalem, a prophet would the Lord God raise up among the Jews, even a Messiah, or in other words, a Savior of the world. So there's three beautiful words for the Savior right there, prophet, Messiah, Savior. And he also spake concerning the prophets, how great a number had testified of these things concerning this Messiah, of whom he had spoken, or this Redeemer of the world. Wherefore, all mankind were in a lost and in a fallen state, and ever would be, save they should rely on this Redeemer. And we learn throughout Scripture that the Holy Ghost will always bear witness of this. You have a Redeemer. He is our Messiah. I think so beautiful that Lehi is testifying of that. He's telling how this will happen, and then Nephi is just hungering to know for himself. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, Nephi is going to get some details about mm -hmm. the dream. 
the purpose of this dream is to lead us to Jesus Christ. Yes. I would love to hear from the audience on how has the Holy Ghost strengthened your testimony of Jesus Christ? Diana. When I was a young girl, <clears throat> I grew up on the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico, and my parents were uh, converts to the church and moved up to Utah as a young girl. I was 11 years old. And so as the years have gone by, um, I was the only one in my family who was active in the church for the longest time. But later on, as life has gone on, I have my daughter and I have my granddaughter here. And so these are the fruits that I have, we have borne from me leaving the reservation. But as I look back on my life, I've also brought along my family, my Native family with me. And so the Holy Ghost has always been by my side and has helped me to maneuver my life into the things that will bring me happiness. Diana, we often feel the Holy Ghost in, in different ways. What does the Holy Ghost feel like to you? The Holy Ghost feels like a warm feeling. It brings me happiness. If it can bring a smile to my face, and I feel like I can, as I've maneuvered my life, I feel like it brings happiness and makes me smile. I know that the Holy Ghost is touching my heart. You know, it's interesting. I, as you're asking this question, Ben, I'm thinking about the role of Lehi mm -hmm. in calling his family. As I've wrestled with, as a family science teacher, right, I get to wrestle with all kinds of questions around gender and identity. Um, as a mother, seeking to be married, to find the right person to marry, questions about staying on the path. And the role of the Holy Ghost, I, I love that when the Savior is going to leave them, there as he's leaving them, that first visit that he has in, in the old world, his ministry, he tells them, but you will not be alone, mm -hmm. for the Father will send the Comforter. And Diana, as you bore testimony of, he does not leave us. We experience the presence of the living reality of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Ghost, and that that gift is a promise that we can have all day every day. What a gift. What a gift. Uh, Margaret Nadal has a beautiful quote talking about how the Holy Ghost can lead us to where we need to be. She says, your Heavenly Father will help you find the right path as you seek His guidance. Remember though, after you pray, you must get off your knees and start doing something positive. Head in the right direction. He will send people along the way who will assist you but you must be doing your part as well. By the gift and power of the Holy Ghost, you can be guided in your trip through life. Jorge, I can't help but think about how often your art is helping to lead people down that path. We have to know that the things that happened here are possible. Mm -hmm. Because if not, God would not be the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is very difficult to explain the means by which God explains Himself. But one can ensure that these things come by the power of the Holy Ghost. When I am at work, as you asked, mm -hmm. there is no doubt that that is what I have to do. And I believe this can be applied to any other human activity. When I sent my first work to Salt Lake for the competition that takes place every three years, I sent this one entitled The Call with a balance of doubts and hopes <laughs> because it was something totally new. When the work arrived, there was a, a phone call from Salt Lake. The work was not only accepted, but I was given the award. And that was the starting point to continue to develop this style and refining it to this day. You know, it's so beautiful to see how, as we've talked about our second topic, how, how God reveals truth by the power of the Holy Ghost through a lot of different means. It really does add to that truth that He is the same yesterday, today, mm -hmm. and forever. Mm -hmm. Thank you both so very much for sharing your thoughts and your experiences and testimonies with us. And for the audience, thank you so much for being here today and sharing with us as well. And for you at home, we still have much to cover in footnotes. Stay with us.
I feel the Spirit by the things that I do, and it makes my heart happy. If I have my faith centered on Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost will speak to me. It's like a warm feeling inside of me. It's like my body talks to me. I even get a little warm and fuzzy inside and know that the Spirit is directing me. I feel love, and this is the Spirit. And when you talk and, and you feel that everything is okay, this is the Spirit. I've noticed specifically when I focus in sacrament and listen to the talks, I can feel the Spirit almost immediately. I'll have confirmations come through either people or church leaders or through something I'm reading in my scriptures, however that might be. I always know it's a confirmation because there's a feeling of the Spirit that comes with it. The Spirit communicates with me. If I am in a position or prepared, to receive it. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience and are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions from 1 Nephi chapters 6 through 10 with Janet and Jorge. We're also joined by Josh Sears. Josh is a gospel scholar and researcher whose areas of interest include Israelite prophecy, and marriage and families in the ancient world. Welcome, Josh. Glad to be here, thanks. So Janet, there's still a lot that we we haven't covered yet mm -hmm. within these chapters. Where else can we go to kind of really discover and capture what is happening within these chapters? Yeah, I think what's so powerful about these sections is they're really setting up the whole work of the Book of Mormon. We have the iron rod compared to the Word of God, the Book of Mormon being the Word of God, the messenger of the covenant, the record that will be used to gather Israel. We see this setting up in chapter 7 where you have Laman and Lemuel rebelling. They've gone back to go get the family of Ishmael, and they're not very far away from Jerusalem, and they're rebelling and turning around again. But then you've got Lehi's vision where he sees them, his tender feelings as he ends, these boys won't come partake, and how much concern he has. So this is really setting up the whole story of the Restoration. Josh, you have taught uh, the Book of Mormon and specifically these chapters several times. What is your overall take? Chapter 8 introduces in a major way the story of the Lamanites now, not just Laman and Lemuel. And Lehi frames it as his fear over Laman and Lemuel, Nephi and Sam, and their descendants mm -hmm. moving forward. And in the vision itself, Laman and Lemuel have a crucial role to play because we often imagine everything in the vision being there all at once. But there's actually a plot progression. At the beginning, it's just a tree. It's at the moment in verse 18, when Laman and Lamuel refuse to come partake of the fruit and they walk away, that the scene shifts and we're introduced to the rod and the path and the river and the building and the midst of darkness. All of these are introduced because and as a result of Laman and Lemuel's refusing to come partake of the fruit. We see this discussion of how are we going to save the Lamanites. So they've got this scattering issue that they are dealing with. And in verse 14, Lehi has the little preview of the solution. And after the house of Israel should be scattered, they should be gathered together again. The natural branches of the olive tree or the remnants of the house of Israel should be grafted in or come to the knowledge of the true Messiah, their Lord and their Redeemer. Eventually, all Lehi's descendants are going to leave the covenant path. They're going to dwindle in unbelief. He sees in 1 Nephi 13 that Jesus is already planning to visit the Nephites in 3 Nephi to teach them the plain and precious truths that he knows they'll need in the last days. And Nephi sees that when the Book of Mormon comes forth in the last days, it will be brought to Lehi's descendants, the Lamanites, and bring them back to the wow. true knowledge of the Messiah. Mm. So there's this plan to get the Lamanites back. Wow. So in other words, here's how I see it. This is all a case study for all people mm -hmm. who have left the covenant path and God's efforts mm -hmm. to bring them back. And that means the Book of Mormon has a message for all of us who fear, like Lehi did, over loved ones. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've had family members, friends, ward members who have left the church, no longer um, on the covenant path. And um, as you all know, we ache for them. As I look at the story of the Lamanites, I think if Heavenly Father is patient working with the Lamanites over nearly 3,000 years to get them to come back, and he wasn't just making it up as he goes, he's making active plans like creating the Book of Mormon in advance to bring them back, creating these opportunities for them to learn about him and come back, that just tells me how dedicated Heavenly Father is to reaching out to those who have wandered. 
Jorge, I would love to hear your experience on how you connect with Lehi and trying to help your family stay focused on Jesus Christ. See, sí. yes, I believe that uh, constant search of the Word of God and prayer are two very important elements that help us to face all situations. To pray to God on a daily basis is something I have done and shared with the younger generations. And the other is not to stray from the Word of God through the Scriptures, to maintain this desire for consultation. It is remarkable how one can take up the same Scripture a year later, at a later time, and it continues encouraging us, strengthening us, and telling us something new. And I ask myself, how is it that I didn't see this before? <laughs> it's a marvel that gives richly. It seems it shows something different and updated to the moment we are living in. It's not history, as we talked about earlier. It's not history. It's um, a current element. And this that we have read is... Uh, it's living scriptures, living sí, truth. Sí. Yeah. Sí. Jorge, I love how you described the importance of having children know that they can turn to God in prayer and that He will answer their prayers. And it seems like Nephi is trying to tell his brothers that. <laughs> so we see in 7, right, as he's telling them, he says, don't you know God? When they're rebelling and wanting to leave and go back to Jerusalem. And he's saying, don't you know this God who sent an angel to appear to you? And, and then he says in verse 12, how is it that ye have forgotten that the Lord is able to do all things according to his will for the children of men, if it so be that they exercise faith in him? Wherefore, let us be faithful to him. And just thinking of you teaching your children about the power of prayer, that we can ask God. We're going to hear that all throughout the Book of Mormon. Ask and ye shall receive as we do throughout Scripture. And that he'll even fulfill the promise of bringing those who are lost back into the knowledge of Him, back into covenant connection with Him. And that's something that our modern prophets have been emphasizing as mm -hmm. well, echoing this Book of Mormon message. In the October 2022 Liahona, President Nelson wrote an article called The Everlasting Covenant, and he taught something that to me is one of the most powerful prophetic promises I've ever heard in my life. President Nelson says, Once we make a covenant with God, we leave neutral ground forever. God will not abandon his relationship with those who have forged such a bond with him. He will love them. He will continue to work with them and offer them opportunities to change. He will forgive them when they repent, and should they stray, he will help them find their way back to him. Once you and I have made a covenant with God, our relationship with him becomes much closer than before our covenant. Now we are bound together. Because of our covenant with God, he will never tire in his efforts to help us, and we will never exhaust his merciful patience with us. Each of us has a special place in God's heart. He has high hopes for us. And again, I think of the Lamanites, God working tirelessly across centuries and centuries, apparently without losing his patience. Yeah. <laughs> I picture Heavenly Father maybe giving humbling experiences to people so they remember their dependence on him or giving them good experiences so they recognize his mercy. But he's going to work with people no matter how long it takes and what he's got to do to entice and invite them back mm. so that when they are ready to use their agency to repent and exercise faith in Jesus Christ, they can experience all the blessings mm -hmm. of the covenant. And that's I, the, the message the Book of Mormon is trying to give us. It's so hopeful that we shouldn't be afraid. We should have hope in a loving Heavenly Father who is tireless in His efforts to bring all His children to Him. 
And that is captured beautifully in Lehi's dream. Yes. Jorge, I have something that will look very familiar to you. Mm. <laughs> Would you mind talking to us a little bit about this piece of art? Well, the process is quite complex and it's taken from various sources. I mean that one has to have a, a knowledge and training with the elements you are going to work with. When working with uh, visual art, fundamentally one has to have a basis of how colors work, the harmonies, the contrasts, the impact of vertical lines with the horizontals and diagonals. All this is a part absolutely technical that works to provoke feelings and reactions in the viewer outside the theme. To paint the gospel, one has to hold all of these artistic elements to communicate a superior idea. And it is not easy. For example, for this topic, where do I put the, the building? You cannot put it just uh, anywhere because it looks nice. In other words, it can be expressed with a diagonal line, with a contrast of one warm color against a cold one. Then, where do I place the people? Art can communicate the idea of a subject and go to the depths of our feelings, of our spirit, more than a pleasant aesthetic sensation of, oh, how pretty, right? Wow. The mists of darkness area is on one side, so it has a, a feeling of contrast with the more elevated celestial area. The sloping line of the river is depressive and conveys that fall. Also, the rod has passed through a foggy area, like it, it happens in our life, sometimes to get out of difficult and obscure moments. And it is rising then from a lower plane, and it is rising, so you have to go up, climb up, so they are diagonal, until you reach the celestial area where the arch is similar to glory, right? There's the water underneath that looks dangerous and treacherous, this river, this filthy water, and the building that's so on the rising up high on that right side. But everyone is drawn to one place, and it's the center where you see this father and mother and children. And the children are not tall enough to reach the fruit, but the parents are enabling them to partake of it, helping them receive that fruit. And so the eye is just drawn beyond the journey, beyond the pain, beyond the wrestle, beyond the darkness, into the promise of that glorious light and that it's shared together in deepest relationship with our families. And then to arrive in the higher state, like people dressed in white, and also arriving together. Yes, together. It is exceptionally important. I love how they are on flat ground. They're amidst all the lines. They are on, they are on a horizontal place of security. And yes, straight. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah, I love, like she was saying, that we're framed by darkness with the river and the building, but the light that comes from the tree and the people that are partaking of the tree draws your eye there. Um, and should for all of us as we come to recognize the blessings of the new and everlasting covenant and uh, the, the atonement of our Savior, Jesus Christ, that light will grab our attention when we truly understand it and we'll, we'll know the right way to go. Mm -hmm. Jorge, how has this particular piece of art strengthen your testimony of Lehi's message from his dream? 
Lehi's testimony is powerful. It is very strong. And Nephi was moved by this, and he wanted to know for himself. This is a teaching that we uh, can replicate in our lives perpetually. Jorge, as a father yourself, how have you helped your own children come to know the things that you already know? We as a family, for reasons of a, an artist's madness, we um, have lived in different places and adapted ourselves to unfamiliar cultures. At one point, we were on an island called Ibiza, which is in the middle of the Mediterranean, and um, the church wasn't there. So we asked permission from the mission president in Barcelona, and we started to have our own sacrament meetings at home. <laughs> and so we began the daily habit as a family to read together a chapter, a few verses from the scriptures. So that was how we did all our reading of the scriptures. And we had our own sacrament meetings in, in our house. And it was an experience very different from someone who meets with a congregation, with a bishop, with brothers and sisters and ministering companionships. So it has been a very good experience. And the scriptures were our iron rod. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that experience. It's wonderful to see the scriptures come to life. Uh, through those personal experiences. What else would you like to go and look at through these chapters, Janet or Josh? Ben, we can't skip the beautiful experience and painful and difficult experience of Nephi himself as he is, he's gone and followed his father's commandments. They've gone and brought the family of Ishmael back. And the Lord softened the heart of Ishmael and his family so that they would be willing to come and then his brothers rebel along with the oldest sons of Ishmael. And it's a really difficult experience for him. They even tie him up. And I think all of us will remember Elder Bednar's really profound teachings about grace being enabling power and his explanation that Nephi must have understood this when he says in 1 Nephi 7, verse 17, but it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord saying, O Lord, According to my faith which is in thee, wilt thou deliver me from the hands of my brethren? Yea, even give me strength that I may burst these bands with which I am bound. And it came to pass that when I had said these words, behold, the bands were loosed from off my hands and feet, and I stood before my brethren, and I spake unto them again. I love how Elder Bednar says, if he had said a prayer then, he might have said, do something bad to these brothers. <laughs> like, could you just <laughs> strike them down, right? But that beautiful witness of what grace is, which is enabling power from Christ himself in covenant relationship with him for us to have the power to surmount, to overcome, enabled to do what is required of us. And we see Nephi's beautiful witness. He knew that power. Yeah, because like Elder Bednar points out, he doesn't say get these bands off me, he says, give me strength that I may burst these bands. And like you said, that's exactly what happens in a covenant relationship. The closer we are to God, mm -hmm. the greater spiritual power that we have and the ability to overcome our challenges and mm -hmm. find rest. Mm -hmm. With this message of the Book of Mormon, there is, a, as you mentioned, Josh, an overarching theme of mankind, the Lamanites, the house of Israel, how we can be redeemed and saved. But what about, how do we look at Lehi's dream on a very personal level? I think it's helpful to recognize that in the scriptures, when it talks about how God interacts with a covenant people, that that is in many ways parallel to how he will treat us as covenant individuals. It's the same covenant, the same goals are all there. So we can see what he does with them and, and recognize that's what's going to happen to me. That's what's going to happen to my family. So for example, I'm going to cheat and jump ahead a little bit again. First Nephi 15, verse 14. 
And at that day shall the remnant of our seed, our descendants, know that they are of the house of Israel and that they are the covenant people of the Lord. And then shall they know and come to the knowledge of their forefathers and also to the knowledge of the gospel of their Redeemer, which was ministered unto their fathers by him. Wherefore, they shall come to the knowledge of their Redeemer and the very points of his doctrine that they may know how to come unto him and be saved. And then at that day, will they not rejoice and give praise unto their everlasting God, their rock and their salvation? Yea, at that day, will they not receive the strength and nourishment from the true vine? Yea, will they not come unto the true fold of God? Behold, I say unto you, yea, they shall be remembered again among the house of Israel. They shall be grafted in, being a natural branch of the olive tree into the true olive tree. And if that's true of the Lamanites, again, it's true of my family. It's true for me, the people I love. We can take all these promises and make them individual. And I, so I think it's so important that we don't just sideline mm -hmm. these kind of passages. That's history. That's people over there. These are very, very personal blessings. As covenant individuals and as covenant families, Jesus Christ invites us all to come unto him and receive of that nourishment that is there. Mm -hmm. Janet? Ben, I was just thinking as he was talking of what a miracle it is every Sunday, the Sabbath day, to experience that redemption again of being freed from bands like Nephi was personally through forgiveness, being remembered, re-put back together in that in that ordinance language that over and over again in the sacrament prayers we hear the word remember. And it's if we as if we are remembered again, only this time woven with his blood and body through us. And that that's happening all the time, every day. And as we participate in ordinances, renewing those covenants and the promises of that, that he will not stop. His is a love that will not let us go individually or for all our families or for the entire family of God until his redeeming work is done. Mm -hmm. So it's a very personal and global and familial experience, this process of redemption. That's beautiful. Thanks, Janet. Jorge, if I never met you uh, and only saw your artwork, mm. I feel like I would know your testimony and I would know your heart. It is so beautiful. I would love to hear of all the experiences, what keeps you on the covenant path? Not letting go of the rod. Fortunately, our main luggage are the scriptures. The frequency with which one includes them in their activities is extremely important. Other than that, the art I am making now obviously helps me and compels me to be aware of the essence of the scriptures and to transmit it by other means, which is neither word nor music, but shape and color. And this helps me to live the gospel in my daily work. And it is an enormous blessing. I really appreciate being able to do so. In my case, I am doing it so that the people who see my art will come closer to God and have more spirituality. Speaking for myself, it helps me yes. and it feeds my spirit. Jorge, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for sharing your gift with the world and for your personal testimony with us today. And Josh, and it's so been so great to have you here with us today. Uh, thank you so much, Janet. Uh, you're thank always you. so great. And the knowledge you two have of the scriptures is wonderful. Thanks for sharing that with us today as well. And for those watching at home, thank you for joining us for this discussion from 1 Nephi chapters 6 through 10. Visit byutv.org slash come follow up for more study and teaching resources. And join us next week as we study 1 Nephi chapters 11 through 15 and discuss Nephi's vision of Christ in the latter days. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.